Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar on design failure modes and effects analysis. I know that, that some people will be taking a little time to get into this webinar. Um, there are some introductory slides I will be taking people through at the moment. But if you should happen to be here and you don't expect to be in a webinar on design failure modes and effects analysis, now is probably a good time to leave discreetly. Okay. Uh, so, if you're sitting comfortably, we'll begin. I'll take you, first of all, through a few introductory slides. My name, by the way, is Rob Fond, and I'll introduce myself more formally a little bit later on, along with my co-presenter, Andrea. Uh, if we could please have the next slide. So, the first thing to mention is that uh, today's webinar, along with the webinar tomorrow, is being recorded and we will distribute the video link for this afterwards so uh, if you miss part if you miss part of it or if you miss day two having attended day one do not worry because they will be made available um we'll take questions on today's webinar uh, we were using the chat feature inside uh, the application for that uh, so do bear in mind as we go through you can raise a question at any point in time but we do ask you to remain on mute during the presentation, and that's really to prevent background noise, to enable better quality in the sound, and to make sure, obviously, that the recording is as good as it, as it might have been. Uh, if you click, please. So here are the proceedings for today and tomorrow. Uh, both sessions will take at, of the order of two hours, uh, we'll try not to keep you any longer than that. Um, session one, which is today, of course, um, is to take you through an overview of the requirements that occur in AS13100 and how they link back to the overarching APQP and PPAP process or standard. We'll also give you an explanation of the intent of each requirement so that um, you can understand how important it is and try to explain for you uh, what success looks like. We'll give you an overview of the design FME approach, the general method today, which um, is aligned to the RM13004 reference manual, which I hope you'll be able to uh, be able to access, but if you're not accessed it already. And we'll give you links to further help and guidance, including uh, obviously the reference manual and um, such associated things. Uh, if you feel unsatisfied by our overview of the method that we give you today, um, in the session tomorrow, we'll be giving you much more detail on some what we call the key care points when we're creating the design FMEA. And particularly, we'll be stepping you through in a little bit more detail all of the um, different steps within the DFMEA method. Um, and we will be showing you some hints and tips of what good looks like uh, and showing you some of the pitfalls you might otherwise uh, fall into. So hopefully that will be all of benefit to you. As I say, there are various points um, during both days, in fact, that will uh, a friendly screen will come up and there will be a time for questions and answers. Um, we will try and do that uh, in, in an efficient way as possible. Um, and but of course don't be afraid to raise questions throughout the presentation because doing that will give us a good idea of the topics we need to touch on for you in that question and answer session okay so uh, could I have the next slide please okay so this is me i am rob Fanden, and i've worked for rolls royce for quite a long time i know it's impossible to believe that looking at my face uh, I have a varied degree, uh, career as a design practitioner, uh, design manager, and a specialist. And in the main, I've worked in in the main I've worked in aerospace within Rolls Royce. I currently have a role which is a, a chief of mechanical systems capability. Amongst other things, that means I look after elements of the design capability. Um, I'm a subject matter expert for APQP and PPAP within Rolls-Royce, particularly on the design side of things, and the defect prevention tool set, including DFMEA. I led the creation of the 
design processes as part of our civil aerospace APQP and PPAT transformation program, which we've just gone through. We now have a policy system in uh, civil aerospace for Rolls-Royce that is based entirely around APQP and PPAP. I'm lead design coach for civil large engines within Rolls-Royce. And as part of my activities for the ASQ, I, I led the authoring team for the DFMEA elements of RM13004 and the S13100 standard. And I'm a deputy team leader for the subject matter interest group for uh, defect prevention. So, so that's me. I'll invite Andrea now to introduce herself on the next slide. If you could move on. So then welcome also from me. Um, yeah, I am today, I want to support uh, Rob and um, some words about me is um, I'm now working for MTU Aero Engines for two years. Uh, before that, I was type inspector for propulsion systems at the German military Aerothness authority. So I had a lot of contact with system safety documents and also FMEAs. Um, at MTU, currently, I'm working as a safety and certification engineer at the Aerothmus department. And so I'm doing system safety assessments, and I'm the main focal point and subject matter expert for the design failure mode and effect analysis. And so I was also included in the process definition um, and the interfaces between the design of MEA and our system safety process and all the other interfaces we have in our company. And I supported the definition of the MTU process, how to do and what to go on with the design failure mode and effect analysis. So I wish you fun for the webinar and we can go to the next slide. Thank you, Andre. <laughs> so just to introduce two more people who are participating today. Um, Steve and Stefan have uh, volunteered to help us by keeping an eye on the chat function for us. Uh, so if you have a question, please remember to put into the chat function and uh, Steve and Stefan will be able to help out hopefully with the questions as well when it comes to those points in the, in the proceedings where we, we pause for questions and answers. So they will be marshalling your inputs as part of the webinar. Uh, so thank you very much, Steve and Stefan for doing that. Next slide, please. So a little bit on the registration, just to give you an idea that you are not alone. Okay, so as of June 20th, so these stats are a couple of days old. Um, there, are, there are over 210 people registered for this webinar, and you can see the, the global split there of where those people are. Uh, a total of 20 different countries represented. Uh, so uh, a good turnout, and hopefully we'll also get a lot of people viewing this as a recording. Uh, next one, please. So an overview of what's going to happen today then. So we will first of all take you through what um, the FMEA requirements are in RM13004 and AS13100. Uh, we will pause then for questions and answers on that particular topic before we go on to this overview of the FMEA method, which as I say, will be a, a fairly short overview, but will hopefully lead into some more detailed sessions tomorrow on uh, aspects of the method itself. Again, we'll pause for questions and then we'll give you some, some insights as to where to go for further information and help. Okay, so that's the proceedings for today. As I say, tomorrow is a different day. Go to the next slide, please. So we all know, as in the aerospace industry, we do amazing things. We do some amazing things. If you click, yeah, please. The consequences of poor quality can, however, be very serious. Uh, some of us maybe have been involved in incidents or investigations. Um, the key point here is, and particularly when it comes to defect prevention, we have a responsibility to do this as well as we can. And learning about the defect reduction tool set is actually part of our responsibility. We need to be able to keep our customers and our passengers and our families when we travel safe. And planning for quality is actually key to making sure that uh, we deliver a safe product as well as a profitable product. 
So we need to make sure that we keep these things in mind. So you're very welcome indeed to be joining us for this DFMEA webinar. Can I have the next slide, please? So the point of all that is to underline that, that really we have to make a conscious effort here. And really we have to, quality has to be caused, not controlled. So we're not, we're not looking to actually prevent escapes. No, we are, but we really want to nip them in the bud, as we say. We want to make sure these things never happen. And we do that by a systematic approach, a systematic approach to examining the inherent risks inside of our product. What we are talking about today is not so much about the performance of our product as the quality of the design of the product. And that's really important for the DFMEA method. The DFMEA method helps you predominantly with producing a good design. Lots of other things can happen that might mean that the, the product isn't what it should be later on. But we're focusing on producing a good design. That is the role of DFMEA. Okay. So we have to cause inherent quality in our design by applying approaches such as DFMEA. And the next slide, please. Uh, so hopefully you're all familiar with these documents. If you're not, we'll show you later on where to get your hands on. Um, so the thing you're seeing on the left is AS 13100. We'll be taking you through the relevant requirements that are inside that in the next section. In the next section. And the, the gold colored book on the right hand side, RM 13004, is an expansion a means of compliance, I don't know, I need a guidance material to help you fulfill those requirements that are in AS 13,100. Uh, generally speaking, it's not a, you must do it this way, but it's a lot of learned people um, explaining how best to do DFMEA and the other quality tools. Uh, so I recommend an examination of both of these to you. Hopefully, we'll explain them well through the course of these two webinars with respect to DFMEA. Next slide, please. And these are uh, the actual um, AS 13100 Chapter C requirements. These are, these are the um, sections in AS 13100 that deal with defect reduction tools. And particularly, we're talking about 21.1 today, which is the design failure and effects analysis section. Okay, that's the first thing we're going to cover. Could I have the next slide? Thank you. Just wanted to signpost this as a resource to you. We're not going to play this video. There is a video available. You can see the link at the bottom of the page here. Uh, it, it takes a few minutes to run through, but it's quite good at explaining how these different defect prevention tools work together to achieve the end goal, which of course is a trouble free product in service that's safe and useful for the customer. So the uh, this video is quite good at explaining that. There are other resources available there on that website. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so this is your first opportunity to engage in the quick chat. And I'm looking to Steve and Stefan just to uh, try and marshal some of the responses for us here. So first of all, have you read 13,100? Just pop a yes in, pop a yes if you're in, in the chat, if you have. I'll just wait for that to roll through for a few moments. It's beautiful to watch. Thank you. Okay. Leave them there. And the next question, have you read 13,004? Okay, and finally, how would you judge your knowledge of design FMEA? A scale of one to four as seen on the screen. Okay. 
Okay. So I'm going to ask Steve and Stefan if they would want to give us a little bit of a, a summary of that for us, if that's possible. It looked to me like uh, there was a mix for question A, but it looked to be dominantly people have read it. Um, less people have read R RM 13004, and there is a varying uh, amount of knowledge of design FMEAs. I saw a lot of twos and threes, uh, a couple ones, uh, a couple fours. Excellent. I'm not sure whether I would have put a four down. I don't know. Um, but it, I mean, it does display, there's a range of knowledge here. Okay. So excuse me if you consider yourself an expert and I'm going through some fairly basic things. Yeah. Because we will do that because we, we need to explain certain things. Um, I'd encourage you to bear with it, though, because actually I'm still learning about the FMEA um, and there is a potential for us to, to have blind spots and sometimes quite significant blind spots in the way the tool works. Um, with regard to whether you've read AS 13100, it's good you've read it, but I think it's actually more important you read RM 13004 right? because you will understand the, the FMEA. MEA better uh, through reading that. And if you do it in the way that RM 13004 suggests, you will comply with AS 13100 in terms of the method. There are a few other things in AS 13100, but please have a good look at 13004. So thank you. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, over to Andrea. So, yeah, thank you, Dan. Uh, we just start with the first chapter about the FMEA requirements before we go deeper in the method itself, because there are some things to consider to, to have a good basis for a DFMEA. So please, next slide. <clears throat> um, the first thing is the question, when should we do the design of FMEA? So, and the uh, AS 13,100 um, recommends to do it for sure when you have a new design, because there you can just uh, look in your new design and um, uh, think about the processes functions there. But also it is recommended when you have changes on your existing design so that you can have a feeling how is the criticality and um, the behavior of, of the system with these changes. And it's also um, proposed to do it for an existing design in a new application, location, or environment. It's nearly the same case like for an existing design with a design change, because there you have to, to think about uh, what could happen in this new location or this new environment and maybe the criticality of some features could change in this way. Next slide. So the AS13100 also give further requirements um, for the DFMEA. There's always the, the sentence that for sure there can be further requirements um, depending on your customer and also on your internal processes. But um, for sure, when you want to do the design of MIA, you should um, be in line with the process of the RM13004. So all of you who just made in the poll that they never read this uh, re reference or guidance material, um, it would be a good idea just to go through and see if the method method you are doing is like the one in, in this manual. There are also um, definitions for the scoring of the severity and the occurrence and the detection in the RM 13004. Um, we will go there in more detail tomorrow how this um, scoring is done. And also then the, the one of the main questions how to calculate um, the risk priority numbers with respect to this scoring for the failure modes and the causes. So in the AS 
100, it is required to calculate it for every failure mode. And we will also show this tomorrow in more detail. And when you have done all of these steps we will discuss, there is always um, the, the last question now, what to do? So what should be the improvement actions and for which failure modes first? And there the AS13100 just requires to do the high severity failure modes first, as well as the combination of a high severity and a high occurrence. And these failure modes with a high risk priority number. But this here first as a short overview, as I said, all of these steps we will go into detail tomorrow. So we can go to the next slide, please. So <clears throat> there are also further other requirements, and I think many of them are quite clear for everyone, but we want to state them here again that they are clear for everyone. At first, when you are doing a design FMEA, it should be a cross-functional team. So I think that is one of the main points because at the end, the DFMEA bases on the experience of all the people who are involved in um, doing this method. And so when you have the expertise from design, analysis, manufacturing, assembly, you can have more experience than if just only one or two persons are doing this together. And you have um, interchange between those people. So maybe there can come more ideas, especially in doing this together. Um, <clears throat> it's also recommended in the AS 13100 to, to participate experts from manufacturing and assembly um, because they also have a lot of experience how um, the parts are manufactured and assembled and how uh, possible failure cases could look like. So next slide, please. Just to um, explain a little bit more in detail why the cross-functional teamwork, um, this is um, the result from an, another study from how teamwork is successful. And I think it's clear for everybody that when you just do it alone, you will not be so successful as if you do it with uh, a bigger team with many different experts. So, and then the next slide. So what we propose is that there should be, as I said, a cross-functional team. There is for sure a team leader and mainly in many processes, it is the um, engineering manager or the, the one who is responsible for the part you are looking at of the system. There is um, often there's also a DFMIA manager. So someone who is responsible for the method and is guiding the others through the process. And then there could be many other specialists. So someone who is responsible for the design, other specialists for, from different departments, validation, for example, how to uh, find several failure modes and also in contact with service quality and reliability experts. Next slide. <clears throat> so when you have the team, there is also the question when to start the design of MEA. <clears throat> so we propose to do it as early as possible, but for sure in the planning phase of APQP. Because um, when you start early, you can get all the experience of also the, during the project to improve your FMEA as often as you can. So there's also always an optimization. And um, as you know, when you find a failure earlier in a development phase, it is better for your cost and your project time. Um, <clears throat> than if you just find it in the 
later in the project. So next slide. So just to show you um, the APQP um, system there, you see that uh, the line of MIA should be start nearly at the end of concept. So there's a concept available, which you can um, describe in your FMIA, but, um, and then just optimize and go in more detail until the design release. You also see here all the other um, processes of APQP, which connects sometimes with the DFMIA and also get information from the DFMIA. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so here are two further requirements is um, what should be the scope? I will discuss them in more detail on the next slide, but here just as a first uh, introduction, for sure, when you want to do a DFMEA, you should first think about the scope you want to um, investigate. And for sure then that the team which is responsible for this design should be also responsible for the design of MEA. And um, also you should look at the system architecture and the interfaces and the interactions because sometimes the criticality comes just from the architecture and also how they interact with other parts. And next slide. <clears throat> so <clears throat> as a short reminder about the scope, what I just um, said at the beginning, you should do the DFMIA for a new design and there, it should be done for the complete new design of this item. And I would say it is the best to have a, a really detailed DFMEA as in, a, in such a detail you can provide depending on the project phase you are in. <clears throat> and that all the risks are named uh, which could, are possible. Um, for changes, you can maybe um, just uh, minimize the scope a little bit so that it is just um, focus on the exist on on the change of the existing design. If there is already a DFMIA for this item available, <clears throat> if not, it is uh, proposed to do um, the DFMIA um, as a new complete one for sure. So when you click next, then there is um, the question why you need to think about the system architecture. Um, as I said, at the beginning, you, you look what is the item you want to uh, investigate and analyze. And analyze. Um, but this item is mostly not alone in, in in your overall system. So it has a role in this system and it's also um, important to think what will happen if this role, role is not fulfilled any longer. And for sure, sometimes um, the design architecture is specified by the customer. And so um, there could be some constraints which has to be considered in the DFMIA as well. And the next slide. <clears throat> and this also means to look at the interfaces and interactions, because when you have just a part, um, you have to think what could happen if this part or this function fails, what could happen for other components and subsystems or systems. And this means physical and functional interfaces, because all of them could have a safety impact or a safety criticality. Um, next slide, please. So 
why are we doing all this, all of these? So why is it so important to have a big um, detailed day of MEA to think about the scope and also the interaction is that the day of MEA is not alone. At the end, you want to, to have a, a documentation for, for your design, but also um, all these informations uh, go into the process failure mode and effect analysis. There can be also an input for the FMECA, so for the reliability and safety assessment. And all of the outputs of the DFMEA should go through an risk ev evaluation and recommended actions. As I said before, we will discuss how this risk evaluation and recommended actions will be done, but there could be some design requirements after all, and also it could be an input for a later verification plan. So when you click, you see <clears throat> that the DFMEA is just one important step in an overall process. And when all of these steps are adequately done, you have a quite good quality closed loop approach. So next slide. <clears throat> um, so tomorrow we will talk about functions, features, items, failure modes, how to how to look at them, how to think about it. But um, it's clear that the DFMIA should be as detailed as necessary. So when you just pre-select inputs, um, it could be that you just miss a, a risk which is not um, maybe focused at the beginning. So the idea is really to look at every function and every feature and every failure mode and to be um, aware that the design of MEA should be as comprehensive as possible. So because at the end, the DFMEA is the documentation you want to use for uh, products which will be used for over 30 years and more. And every design change and every deviation and also service experience can go in the DFMEA and also can be evaluated with this document. And so the next slide. Uh, you can click again. Okay. Um, so here you see the um, four requirements again, and at the, at, in the middle you see the goal to have a design of MIA um, in, in alignment with the requirements of the AS 13,100. So we think that when you um, have these requirements and work with them, you ha could have a good design failure mode analysis as documentation. <clears throat> but for sure, when you are finished, all of these risks should or must drive actions. Um, because if you only use it as documentation, um, yeah, you do not have really this um, preventive quality approach you want to have with this um, method. And if you click next, you see the last requirement that the design of MEA is a living document. So I said it in the slide before, all of the experience you gain during the design project, but also afterwards should be updated the design of MEA because um, at the end, all of this documentation can help for further projects and also for further changes or um, concessions. This brings us to my last slide. Um, All together, at the beginning, you start just with the design of MEA, depending on if it is a new design or a changed design or a changed application. 
you get the informations maybe from a from a previous um, product and also or similar product and you get information from analysis and testing data and in service data and with all this together you can always update these um, document and get a new or changed design FR. So at the beginning for a new design, it could be take some time to, to write the design failure mode and defect analysis. But um, if you just have this as a basis, every further change uh, will improve your product and your work. So next slide so this was really uh, a fast uh, first wrap up about the requirements um, which you should um, look into when you want to do the dfmia so i give you the word rob thank you um uh, we were going to pause for questions at a particular time so it seems appropriate to do so. We've had a few questions coming in from the chat. Um, if uh, Stephen and, and Stefan can perhaps feed one or two questions to us or uh, interpret from the chat. But one thing, one thing I did pick up was the the OE uh, interaction. So if your customer is an engine manufacturer um, and there's an organisational divide, okay. How do you get the right information from them in, in order to be able to perform the DFMEA correctly? Um, with, um, difficult. You cannot really effectively do a DFMEA without understanding the place inside the system, which requires the, the OE to actually provide you some information about where your component sits, its environment, and actually the, the potential progressions within the subsystem to system level of any failures that might occur with your particular component. Um, you should only be doing this though, you should only be doing a DFMEA anyway if you have a design accountability. So if you're a design make supplier, absolutely we want you to do a DFMEA. If you're a make to print environment, um, then you're not to do one, yeah? Because the person who created the drawing in the first place is the person who should be doing the DFMEA. DFMEA is an active tool to be used inside the design process that removes errors in the design. So if you're doing it on a drawing that's already finished, it's too late. It's too late. Okay. Um, is there anything other than my comments to pick up on from that, Andrea, Steve, Stefan? I see that we've got a question about Famica. I'm going to come on to that shortly. Bear with us on that one. Yeah, I think there was a comment in the chat about currently OE does not share design FMEAs with suppliers or ask for supplier input, but that's something that you know hopefully we can change going forward. That may be a cultural thing that we change that while you may not share your whole DFAMIA. There's definitely information sharing that can go on. Absolutely. And how how you can we'll get onto this in, in a little while when we come onto the method, but how you can effectively score the severity of a failure mode without understanding the system level. I don't really know. Right. So you, you need some information on that. You need some information. So there's a question about uh, the AIG and VDA FAMIA handbook. Is there any alignment, I think, is the question between RM13004 and the, the AIG VDA methodology? It's not one I'm terribly familiar with. I don't know if any of us can answer that necessarily. I, I would suggest that most most standards that talk about DFMEA have some common elements. Uh, most design risk analysis has some common elements. Um, but I wouldn't like to comment without actually taking that one away. Okay. I will, I will say that, that that one is the uh, automotive AIG VDA is a, an updated methodology for 
FAMIAs, um, and they do have some additional uh, aspects such as action priority that in place of RPN. Um, and I believe RM 13004 does reference the, you know, the ability to implement action priority numbers uh, as an RPN uh, as an acceptable method. A fairly detailed question. Anything that we um, anything that we can't answer through the actual webinar, we will of course get a transcript of the, the chat, and hopefully we can address any any outline questions from that. Okay. Um, no, sir, is there is a, another quick question? Is there a benefit of to, uh, of doing a DFMA retrospectively if doing a modification of a part? I think this is really linked to the the point that Andrea uh, submitted. If there's a design into the a change into the design, you can reduce the scope of uh, analysis and uh, only uh, make a DFMA on this uh, modification. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, the AS 13,100 just say you can just look at the scope of the change just to um, look at the criticality of this change. But it's re recommended to do in this case um, the DFMIA for, for the whole part because maybe there will be another change afterwards. So you are doing a lot of change DFMIAs and it would be beneficial then to do just one big one and then just always updated it for further changes and get a better view of the overall part. Yes, there are three main triggers. I think we have a slide that shows this a bit later on, but there are three main triggers to when you do a DFMEA. And it all relates to when you're actually doing design activity in one form or another. The, the, the first is when you're creating a new design. Um, I think that's fairly obvious, in which case you've got a scope which is around the whole design and the whole of its functionality. The second is when you've got a modified design, in which case you can scope the DFMEA around those modified features and the impacted functions of those modified features. The third case in which you do it is when you're not changing the design at all, but you perhaps read the same design in a different environment or with a modified operational envelope, operational envelope in which case you need to look at the functions. Okay, so it scopes around the functions rather than the features. That broadly is 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 the triggers and the way you think about scoping of the DFMEA. Okay, I'm, I think I'm going to suggest we move on to the next section, and I think I take over now. So we're going to give you a quick a quick overview of the um, of the DFMEA method. So it's a method that's designed to uh, recognize and evaluate the potential failures of an item and the effects that it, uh, and the design related causes of those, those features. Uh, so really you're doing this as part of the design activity. It's focused, focused around the design itself. It's an analysis of a particular design standard, a particular design proposal. And it, it is scoped around um, the functional effects, um, the functions that might not be realized if you get the design wrong. It is functional in nature. Um, other things like cost, non-functional parameter, producibility, as we call it, is a non-functional parameter. They aren't main focuses of DFMEA. It all comes from the function, and that's why all comes from the functions are actually um, over on the left side and a starting point for the DFMEA activity. So what we're trying to do is look at the functional failures that might be possible for this thing and the causes for them. Come on to what exactly the cause is in a moment. By actions that eliminate or reduce the chance of failures occurring. By a failure, I mean a design failure. I don't necessarily mean a physical failure. So let me explain again what I mean by that. A design fails when it fails to meet a requirement in this case, a functional requirement. So what I'm looking for is to, is to try and identify the things that could be designed wrong 
and make sure I design them right. That fundamentally is the purpose of the DFMEA. But I'm only doing it in, with a lens on the functionality, not in terms of its cost or any other non function. So it, it is really about, it's a form of risk management. Absolutely, it's a form of risk management. But the focus is actually on improving the design, getting rid of defects in the design. It lives in the design world. Okay. So we can click, please. So types of FMEA. Um, this is why I deferred the previous question about FMEA. There was also a question um, earlier on in the chat about FFMEA, functional failure mode analysis, and where that sits uh, relative to design FMEA. So the primary objective of an FMEA of any type is to improve the product. The difference is actually in the first character of the FMEA. By that I mean a DFMEA or a PFMEA. Because the entire focus on the DFMEA is about improving the design. The entire focus on the PFMEA is about improving the process. The entire focus on an FFMEA is improving the flow of function through the architecture of the system. So in the sense, FFMEA lives well upstream it lives in a world before you really have a design that you could draw down or sketch down on a piece of paper. Um, it lives in the functional world where you're thinking about modules, you're thinking about um, architecture and how the functions might be realized. It's very early. And in most cases, particularly in the cases where we're contracting a design make supplier, that's well upstream, well upstream of where we need to be. Generally have a concept or a standard on the shelf that we're going to analyze as a starting point. So um, process design FMEA's objective is to improve the design. Yeah. Uh, that could be the design of the system, of the subsystem, or of the component. You can apply the same method at multiple levels and the we won't get into that just now. The process FMEA uh, has an objective of improving the design of the process that realizes the product. So the manufacturing or assembly pro uh, process or the overall process you could run the PFMEA on. Um, the Mika is, is kind of, I think of it as a different thing. And th the way I think of this is actually that, that the Mika is a form of analysis rather than a form of improvement, right? For me, Although FMEA says failure modes and effects analysis, think of the A in a DFMEA or a PFMEA as being avoidance. Because you're trying to design out, either from the design or from the process, you're trying to design out the failure. At, in, in, you know, before it goes anywhere, before it gets to the customer. For me, it is more about articulating and calculating a numerical risk value that's returned on the product that you make, operation of the product. So it has a different role within the process. It, it's less of a driver inside the process of design, and it's more about a form of analysis that underwrites the safety of your product. Okay, so think about it in that slightly different way. FMECA is a form of analysis that returns a numeric value about your safety. Whereas a DFMEA is all about improving your design. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So inputs and outputs. A DFMEA takes lots of information in and it actually spits a few things out. Okay. Um, you need functional requirements. Right, whether, whether you get those from things like boundary diagrams or parameter diagrams or system analysis and systems engineering model or wherever you get those functions from, you need some functions uh, and you need design concepts, right? If you haven't got a design concept, you haven't got a definition of any kind, you can't analyze it. It sounds basic, doesn't it? But you can't do an analysis of a design that you haven't got, right? So DFMEA needs a design to work. It needs a, a concept that you could draw through. You sometimes need manufacturing data. Probably more importantly, you need the ME in the room 
if you're going to do a good one. The bill of materials is important because it gives you some information about system hierarchy uh, and how the system fits together. Service data history can indicate mechanisms that might need to be considered. Lessons learned, best practice, all sorts of things can, can feed in. An important one is a baseline DFMEA. Now, by a baseline DFMEA, I usually mean, I mean one that was done on the pre-mod standard or one that was done on the standard that you're picking off the shelf to adapt. So if you, you're, if you have a, a family of components, like a product line, you should really have a standard DFMEA that goes alongside it. And that is one that you can pull in as a baseline. Higher level DFMEAs are important because they give context. They give an escalation of failure that will tell you the consequence of your component failure. And the design verification plan is kind of important as well. And it, and it kind of is, it gets developed as the DFMEA goes along to a certain extent. But there are standard verification activities that you would put alongside phase two, typically, would be in phase one actually, but phase two of APQP they figure in some of the controls that you will see as you go across into um, the um, in, into the middle, let's say, of the, the uh, FMEA. So you, you do with the FMEA, it will actually spit out some things for you. It will, it will spit out a risk assessment. And there's no doubt about it. The RPNs are a form of risk assessment, but they are, they are about assessing the risks inherent in the design not about assessing the risk of the, the customer, right? This is about getting the design right. The risk is a risk of getting the design right. Okay. Um, a good DFMEA should produce actions, right? So things you can do better this time to make sure it's better than last time. You do an initial analysis and then you will create some actions that, that feed on that go further and hopefully reduce your scores uh, mean success later on. You will also use your DFMEA as a means of identifying those things in APQ, those things in APQ or CISACs, critical items and key characteristics, right? They will be suggested uh, primarily by the things in the course called column. So I need to come on to what a course is, uh, but within a DFMEA, a CI or a KC, and CI particularly could be anything inside APQ, but it could be a requirement or a function or anything. But particularly when we think about them in the context of the DFMEA, it's about causes. What things do I really need to focus on to make sure I get the design right? Okay, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So here is a template. And you'll see on these templates as we go through both today and tomorrow, there are there are standard set of examples. These are a neutralized examples. Uh, some would say they're a little bit uh, basic, but um, don't worry about that. They serve a purpose of trying to illustrate what type of, inf what type of information you're looking for in each box. And um, we're going to divide for you the FMEA template into a number of different sections, one, one through to six. Okay, so looking at section one, first of all, if you click, beautiful, all right? So uh, they're around scope, okay? What is the item that you're focusing on? In other words, what is it you're designing, okay? What function does, it, does that item have? What you're trying to achieve? So build on the function by saying how much of that function you're looking for and what the performance of that function is. Now, you, you typically get fed that as a specification or a set of requirements inputting into the design, okay? Um, but your DFMEA should certainly for that first component, you know, for first time through for a new design should include all the functions that you're expecting that component to have. If you click me again, please. Section two then, um, how could you get the design, the requirement wrong? Right? How could I fail to meet that requirement? Uh, what would happen if it went wrong? What are the potential effects? Um, how bad would it be if it went wrong? Uh, that results in a severity score. So the matter of failure could be, um, I don't achieve the requirement. I come under it. I do too much of it. I sometimes don't meet the requirement because it's intermittent behavior. 
there are various permutations here that you can have for the failure mode. They will suggest different severities. Uh, severity is always scored at the top level of the system, which is why you can't really do a DFMEA in the absence of any system information. You can't do that. Something needs to come down to you. Okay. Could you click the section three, please? Okay, so importantly now, I'm going to talk about causes. Because this section here is all about the causes. The causes uh, are what, what would get wrong in the design to cause the failure mode. Right? They are potential causes. Um, it is always, always, I'll go again, one more, always related to something you are producing in the design and specifying in the design. So it will come down to something you have created. Yeah, you have created you have created this feature, this dimension, this whatever it is, and it could be gone. You could get it wrong in sort of the design process. Now that's kind of important when it comes to the next column because the prevention controls are the things you are going to do in the design process that will help you make sure you get that clause right. Okay, and you'll assign an occurrence score which relates to how often you get the design wrong. In other words, think about it the other way, it relates to the confidence you have in the design you produce based on the prevention. The next column, which is already clicked, thank you, um, thank you, talks about detection controls. And this is about how you check if you've got the design right. Right? Um, so how likely is it that you could detect the cause or the failure mode that comes from it, um, given the testing that you're about to do or the analysis you're about to do? The score, which comes alongside that uh, detection control, relates quite often to how late in the day that detection is, not how strong it is necessarily. It, you know, it goes, it, you get a bad score for a late detection. Okay. Um, and then in section five, if you click, you'll get a, you get an RPN. This is a risk priority number which is to be used um, with care. And I'll come on to that later. And section six are improvement actions. Uh, if you click for me, please. So the improvement actions are things you are going to come up with because you're not happy with the score you got, either the severity or the occurrence or the combination of severity and occurrence, or the RPN itself is too high for you to be comfortable about. So you need to go and do something else, some additional prevention or detection controls. We're not going to put that into the prevention columns. We're going to put them into the improvement actions. The reason being, um, we hold the prevention controls and detection controls in those columns to be the ones that were in the original plan and they're usually the standard sort of activities you do to get this sort of component right. Okay. So that, in a nutshell, is what we're going to do. And I'm going to go through it again. I've told you it once. I'm going to go through it again. All right. A little more slowly. And I'll show you the information flow now. You can go to the next slide, please. So this is the DFMEA information flow. And not surprisingly, like every good book, it reads from left to right. Apologies if your alphabet goes from right to left. Okay, so we're going to start in the top left-hand corner. If you click, please. Our item we're going to analyze is a fuel air bracket. Okay, its function, click, is to prevent excessive lateral motion of fuel tube. Okay, and you're giving it some parameters here, X, Y, Z, right, in which direction. Does it, does it need to be uh, prevent excessive lateral motion? Click. That leads to a requirement. So I'm trying to put a value around that function. And that is important, that value. I'm saying it needs to be less than X millimeters. Okay. Because unless I put a value on it, I won't know when I've failed that function. Okay. So next, click the failure modes. They relate to failing that requirement. In this case, I've got a lateral motion that's greater than X millimeters. Then I'll think about the effect. Click. 
I could end up with a fire, explosion, safety, hazard, all sorts of calamity, right? And that, because it's got the word hazard in it, there's a potential danger to life here. It's a 10. Come back to the scoring tables later, but that one's a 10. If you click for me again, please. I now start thinking about potential causes, and they don't relate to the severity. They actually relate back to the failure mode. Okay, so I'm going back a little bit. My next thing about causes. So what causes could lead me to have a fuel tube lateral motion of greater than X millimeters? And remember, I should be thinking about actual features I designed here. Uh, so the first one I probably thought we could think of is a tube locating hole, allowable diameter defined as too large. That's one. There's another one where the bracket thermal growth you find is uh, greater than the tube thermal growth, which relates to design decisions. All of these causes relate to design decisions that you get wrong. So the next one, if you're going to go down to the, you know, the actual root cause might end up as a, as a, as a pick the wrong material or whatever. Um, and then if I think about the prevention controls, Next, they relate to the potential causes. So it's about how I make sure I get that potential cause. Remember, that's a part of the design specification. How I get that right. In this case, forms of analysis are identified. All right. And the occurrence score that goes with that relates to, remember, the confidence in that prevention control in, get, in getting it right. And then we come to detection. Remember, I'm detecting the failure. Detect the failure mode to detect the cause. Okay, so I'm trying to detect the failure mode. Um, I'm trying to detect that lateral motion, and I'm going to do that in this case with some durability testing on an engine. Okay, and because of where that is in the development program, it's quite late, quite late-ish. I'm going to score it as a six. Okay. Remember, there'll be lots more detail on day two on these things when we come to it. Could you click on to the next slide for me, please? Oh, sorry, one more thing on here. The RPN is calculated based upon those numbers, right? Um, that's all we need to bear in mind. Yes, if you do click for me now, please, thank you. So you see there how I've described that, how um, the description in each column, the text you put in each column follows logically from its predecessor. Okay. Um, remember that it's important because actually you need greater scrutiny actually on the left hand side of this than you need on the right hand side of this. And we'll explain that a little bit. Any fault you make, any problem you put in, any error you make in the function column goes all the way to the right hand side. It's all the way to the right hand with the wrong actions, end up with the wrong score, you'll end up with the wrong design, design. Right. So precision in language is really important. Um that you you need to make sure that you can this is human readable and it flows naturally as a as a dialogue going from left to right. But you need it to be Make sure you're precise with the language that you use, that a function is a function and a cause is a cause, etc. More on that tomorrow. Okay. And next slide, please. Data sources. Now, I can see lots of questions coming on the chat. I'm just going to choose to ignore them for the moment and we'll come back to them all and, and lock them up afterwards. I see some answers are going in from our experts too, which is good to see. So, where do I get the data from? Uh, the item, of course, comes from the design and from the architecture as well of the product that you're, you're talking about. So this is a bracket, but what is it a bracket for? It's, it's a people there, but okay, yeah, so th that's what it is. What are the functions? You need that to be fed to you if you're going to understand or do a DFME at all. It's pretty clear, isn't it, that you need to know what this thing is meant to do before you can tell if it might not do it. Okay. So the functional requirements tend to be flowed to you, but you might write some of your own as you as you go on a journey with a DFM in the end. Um, effects, nature of failure, that sort of thing can come from lessons learned based on DFMEA. That's where that standard DFMEA comes in, service data. Uh, 
safety and reliability analysis, uh, functional hazard assessment, all that sort of thing can actually feed into these columns too and give you an insight. And it'll be for Mika if you have it, yeah, or a baseline for Mika could give you some information here that you need to do. Um, causes, remember, are parts of your design. Prevention controls and detection controls come from standard work. Okay, standard work mainly, experience and other projects that's baked into a standard plan. Particularly, your detection activities tend to come more from your verification and validation planning. Um, but of course, some, yeah, they're not mutually exclusive prevention and detection. Sometimes a thing can occur in both. Right? It can be both a form of preventing an error and also a form of detecting a failure mode. So bear that in mind, you can have the same thing in two boxes. Uh, okay. Could I ask you to click on for me, please? I promised you some scoring tables and here they are. If you want to read them at length, you can find them in RM 13004. Please use the ones in RM13004 unless your roadway tells you to use something else. It's unlikely they will, not if they've taken the tablets of AS13100 properly. Uh, but only use alternative ranking criteria if it's approved by the customer. Yeah, that's important, and that is one of the AS13100 rules. So I have the next slide, please. Okay, so risk priority number scoring. Um, I've got two slides on this. I, I, yes, just click for me, please, to the end of this slide. I think there's one more. Okay, so the RPN is actually SOD, severity times occurrence times detection. Um, in this case, of course, we'll work it out. Uh, but importantly, if we go to the next slide, right, there's a recipe for how you do this. Now, when you follow the FMEA method properly, the primitive, if you like, the basic element is actually the cause. Each line, each cause in the DFMEA will get its own line in the DFMEA. If you click. Now, for each failure mode, and remember the cause gives you the failure mode, you're going to score the highest severity corresponding to the two corresponding to failure effects. So some might have more, some have more than one failure propagation, more than one type of failure, even. Uh, more than one effect, sorry. But score the highest. That's what you do. Click, please. Now, the prevention controls, you're going to take a look at those and you're actually going to take the most effective prevention control, the best prevention control you, you have, and you're going to score for that. That's why in the prevention column, you will you will see sometimes things in brackets, and they relate to the different preventions, you know, the, the occurrence you will get from each prevention control. And you're going to pick the best one. And similarly, click, you're going to pick, by the same logic, the lowest detection score, right? So the best committed act detection activity you've got, you're going to score it on that basis because you're going to trust that one. Uh, the method works, believe me. You're going, to, you're going to pick that one and score it that way. Which means in this particular case, if you click again, the, different, the three different causes you've got there get these three different RPNs. And those RPNs relate to every potential cause and failure mode combination. If you look at it, it goes back to the causes. Right. So, and we're going to talk about um, in the next slide how we take that information, those numbers, and, and convert them into an action plan. Could you click for me, please? Fantastic. So these are my RPNs, right? Um, I've got several RPNs here that are over six hundred over 500, sorry, and they, they're coming down, right? I've got lots, um, lots of failure modes here, lots of lines in the A, I'm sorry, lots of FMEA lines, lines in the FMEA that lead to 
progressively lower uh, Pareto's of um, RPM. But that's not really that important. If you click on again for me, please. What we're going to ask you to do in terms of priority for improvement is look first at those things that have high severities, because you're going to try and design out the safety failures first. Yeah, the safety failures first. Then you're going to look at the combination of severity times occurrence and prioritize those with the highest S times O. Because you're trying to design out errors, and S times O gives you those most likely errors that give you the highest severity. And then only then and only then will you start to consider the high RPM scores. Because you might get a high RPM because you know severity is low, but the detection is never. Okay. So it's important to do things in this order. It drives the right behavior and it drives you improving the right elements in the design early in the demand. Okay. So do treat this as, as a good recipe. And the last thing then is if you click once more, you try to make this as angry as possible. In fact, the text could be bigger. Please don't use threshold. Don't use threshold up here. They, they just don't work. They don't, they don't work. Okay. So if you're going to ask me what a high RPN is, I'm not interested, quite frankly. Tell me what your high severities are and tell me what your high severity times occurrence are. First of all, and go for those. Okay, go for those. Um, then we can have a discussion about RPMs if you like. Okay, clear on, please. Clear on, please. So, just a few points then on risk mitigations. If you end up with some high scores, right, this is how you might choose to treat them. A high severity score can only actually be addressed by redesign. Okay. And actually, usually, it's not redesign of the component you're doing the FMEA on, it's either the system it sits in. Okay. Because a high severity here might mean that you need a redundancy building in. It might mean, might, um, it might be driving other actions further up in the system, which will actually have the effect of reducing the severity of any failure of your component. So it's an architectural thing. I mean, it belongs higher up the system hierarchy. So that typically is how you address a severity score that's high. The current scores, they can be reduced by generating more experience within analysis or testing during the early design phase. So, so typically, the, typically the, whether something goes into the occurrence or detection column depends primarily when you get the information back. If it's early enough to influence the design choice, something we call design freeze, when we put the pencil down on the design, then it goes into the occurrence. Okay. If it's later than that, it will certainly go into detection, but it's not hard and fast. Some things, as I say, can appear in both. But certainly anything that goes into the occurrence needs to be before you finish the design. Okay. Before it's frozen. Um, so anything that gives you better experience, be it analysis or test or whatever, uh, read across anything that you can do that will, um, improve your chances of getting the design right will actually address this occurrence score. Detection scores you can influence through enhanced or earlier testing. That's that's all you can do because you it, it's a little bit after the um bolted if you get into detection, which is why we always prioritize occurrence. Okay. What we're trying to do with detection, of course, is to detect an area that's already there. Right. And what we say is if you're going to do a detection, let's try and have an earlier one as possible. So that's really how you address the detection. Could I have the next slide, please? So this is some of the things that might end up then as improvement actions. You see, I've got uh, I've got a high severity there, which is driving me to think about improvement actions. All right. 
I've also got a fairly high occurrence and I've got a light detection. So it's not a good recipe, this one. You notice in that I didn't even mention the RPM, right? Severity and occurrence. That's enough to make me worried. So what's my recommended action? If I click one here, okay, I've gone first of all, I'm accepting the system design above me as a constraint. I've got to design my component right because it has this safety effect if I get it wrong. So what I'm going to do is put more emphasis on getting the prevention actions right, uh, the things that come in early. So my recommended action in this place, on top of what I've already got inside the prevention, is to um, conduct high cycle fatigue and tube wear analysis, right? And I believe that will get my occurrence score down to I've improved my confidence in the design. Could I have another clip, please? Here we go. Thank you. Now, this, this treatment actually says, well, let's say I can't do anything in the occurrence column. I can't do any more analysis or whatever. There's nothing I can think of. But what I could do then is an accelerated stress test. And that would have the, the, the effect of reducing my detection score. So that's another way of treating the same issue. It's less effective than the first one, right? Because remember, it's only a detection. The error has already occurred. And so I would have recommended the top one. The top one is the better action. Could I have the next slide, please? So one of the major pushbacks you're going to get with TFMEA is how long it takes. Oh, and isn't it tedious? You know, how long can you spend looking at a spreadsheet or a table? Well, the, the answer is actually there is a benefit to this. As you get better at doing it, it becomes less of an annoyance. It becomes easier. Um, and also progressively, the quality of your TFMEA is improved, so you find more things by doing them. So actively, you find actually you find the more often you do this, not only the quicker you get, but you got a better chance of catching you know catching the escape. Yeah, you got a better chance of improving the product. Um, so of course I'm going to recommend it to you as a method, but in many cases this comes down to belief. Most of the people who are naysayers are DFMEA. You just see it as waste. But if you've done enough, you start to believe that the method does push things out, perhaps not in the way you'd anticipated, but it does push things out and you start to get the benefits. Okay, could I have the next slide, please? Right. So, having taken you a breakneck speed through the method, I'm going to ask you to. Um, Again, pop a little one to four in the chat box in answer to this question. And if again, Steve and Stefan could have a look at the responses that are coming through. How well does your company currently comply to AS 13,100 and R at 13,004 as we've explained it? See the answers coming in. Okay, thank you. Now I was watching that as well as Stefan and Steve because I've I've managed to um, sort it out on my computer screen. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm seeing a wide range, all all the same, you know, all the way from not at all through to this is the way we do it, and it's really encouraging to see that this is the way that that some organisations do the DFMEAs. But there's no inherent reason why everybody can't do them this way. Unless, of course, you're not required to, and in which case you're not required to. Um, okay, I'm going to move straight on from there to another question and answer session. If we can have the next slide, please. 
And uh, as I was presenting, I wasn't busily watching all the questions coming in. I know there were some. Uh, so, um, Steve and Stefan, would you mind just going back and uh, filtering out any questions, first of all? So, there was a question on what is meant by high when we talk high severity scores. Uh, you, you're going to ask me to put a number on it. Well, I, I'll just answer it. If you look at the table that um, that we've got in the standard, of course, some scores are higher than others. We reserve the high scores, the nines and tens, for things that have a safety impact, clearly. So, I guess the other things that have um, an Im a direct impact on primary function for the component. And you get secondary function, and you get some things like annoyance, yeah, at the bottom. Uh, so what what do I what do I say is high? Well, it's in the eyes of the beholder, isn't it? Really. If the intent of the question is, at what value would I tell you not to to stop thinking about treating actions? I say I'm not going to do that because I think it's the designer has to take a look at what the information is telling him and really ask what we will call an alert question, which is, can I reasonably do anything about that? Because we're looking for improvement in all cases. Now, for sure, if I get ones and twos and severities, I will ask them. Right? But if I start to get threes and fours, and I know they're going to cause somebody an annoyance, I start to take notice. So I do ask myself if I'm going to do anything. I will never leave a nine and a ten. I will never leave a seven and an eight. If that helps. Steve, Stefan, Andrea, any thoughts? No, I don't agree with what you said. Question just coming on does you know different teams scoring different FMEAs differently? I don't think that matters. Because what really matters about the GFMEA is not the numbers, it's the improvement actions. So as long as, you know, it's a subjective process scoring a GFMEA. Um, if somebody in a particular session says, I think that's a seven, the session says an eight, I've been in sessions where they've argued that for an hour and a half. They've argued. I walk out, I get a coffee, and I come back in and say, look, it's an eight. Just get on with it because actually, what you're looking for is the improvements. You're not looking for the score. The score is thrown away at the end of the day. That, that's my view, anyway. Any any other thoughts from anyone? Yeah, I think what typically you find is different teams will have different scoring, so it doesn't really benefit you to argue too much between a six and a seven, for example. Um, what is of more consequences if um, one area is identifying a safety failure and another area isn't on a similar sort of component in a similar sort of situation? Somebody's getting it wrong. Right? And the answer is that that ought to be reconciled in some way. Yeah. But the answer is you can't particularly compare DFM, one DFMEA to another, not in that way. I, I think you can, you can take a look at bulk data and say, um, I, I'm getting an awful lot of safety failure modes on this particular component, for instance. Uh, that team isn't giving me any, and that might give me an indication that, that somebody's getting things slightly wrong. But I, I don't think the scores in themselves, you know, give you any comparative information. For me, it's a different matter, right? Because for me, is absolutely numerate. You know, it, um, the FMEA is meant to be quick fairly subject and drive you to design improvement. And as long as your scoring pattern drives you to design improvement, I don't get too crazy to improvement. I don't. Um, any other things coming from the questions? There's a question. Would there be a benefit to Pareto the individual uh, SOD scores separately versus a Pareto of the final RPN? Uh, yes. In fact, I've seen this done sometimes. 
Uh, I haven't got an example in the slide pack. I believe, did we, I can't remember if we put one in RM 13,004, but there is a, um, there's a diagram that looks at severity times occurrence. This, yeah, and it gives you a heat map of the different scores. So you can compare high severities um, against the high occurrences and, and high severities against high, high detections separately. And that kind of gives you that sort of information by the sort of zones you appear on what's called the probability impact diagram. You can actually pick out the ones that you, you're really going to be interested in. So I think there is a benefit in that. People tend to do an RPM Pareto, but if somebody did a severity Pareto or, and they did an S times the O Pareto, yes, it will give you very valuable information. You can start in your mind to, to draw a waterline if you want to. But don't do it with an RPM. Um, other questions? So I had one more just come in. How best to communicate communicate to a customer when your part fits in their system and your part has a high severity that you can't do anything about. Well, there's a dialogue that's involved. Um, if you can't, if you, yeah. And there's a high severity, the chances are that you won't be able to do anything about it with your component design. We just covered that. So you have to let um you have to let the customer know. Okay, because there may be something then that he needs to consider or they need to consider in their design process. So if your bracket is gonna fail and it's gonna give you a fire. The customer might want to think about providing more brackets so there's a redundancy, for example. So they, they need to know you've got to escalate, is what I'm saying. And best design organizations will know what to do with an escalation from one system level to the other. It can actually mean that there's been a missing requirement. It can mean that there's been a slip up in the, the architectural definition of the product. So another system is required. And DFMEA is a marching feast, if you understand what I mean. You learn things as you go along and your starting assumptions can become different. Because for instance, if you, if you flag up, you've got this failure mode and the higher system level changes their architecture in order to account for it, then of course your score is going to change, not theirs. It's going to impact yours. So actually, um, if they change the system, your severity is going to change. So you need to know what they've done about what it is that you've identified. And I, okay. I, I would say that there are going to be times when you will have a high severity that you can't do anything about, which makes your your uh, prevention and detection become uh, specifically prevention become even more. Uh, critical in, in your thinking. That's right. If you can do nothing about it and your customer tells you that there's nothing they can do about it, you've got to get it right. You've got to get it right. Um, you might even be flowing to other parts of the organization that you need to get the manufacturer of this thing right too. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do that through CIs and KCs. Any other themes to pick up on? So we just had one more come in. ARP 5580 calls for supplier contractor integration, including flow down of agreed parameters, language to help flow high risk up and down the system so that issues can be addressed. I think that's more of a comment than a question. Yeah. I mean, this, this, this whole issue of, of integration, I mean, you, you, you cannot do, if there's, if there's nothing else you're going to take away from this afternoon, this, this morning, if it's your morning, um, you can't do a DFMEA in isolation of 
the design of the system that sits above it. They, they've got to talk to each other. There can be many occasions where something you identify impacts what they need to do and vice versa. So th there's got to be that interaction and we need to find ways of managing that. If you get pushback on that issue, um, you could refer anybody to the SMEs that sit inside that particular organization. So Steve could take it for GE, I could take it for upfront. Okay. Are we happy to move on? I think we're good. It's happy, always happy. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Andrea for the uh, last few slides. <laughs> yes, thank you. So the last chapter for today, just a short summary and wrap up, and then uh, some information where you can find further information, what we just uh, talked today, and also about the method we will discuss tomorrow in more detail. So just please click. So the the summary really the success factors we just talked about. So what you should think about when you want to do the design of MIA is at first do the right preparation. So think about the scope, the architecture, the interfaces, so that it's really clear um, what you want to talk about and what could be the functions and uh, requirements you um, want to discuss in the design of MIA. And work as a cross-functional team. As I said, there is um, you are more efficient, and also you get the experience from many different teams and uh, from different persons. And in the interaction, it could be really beneficial to see different point of views. And for sure, these teams should be prepared to get on and try it, and they should avoid procrastination. So start as soon as possible with the design of MEA and um, it will help you in later project phases and especially for, for the time critical ending when you're just uh, at the end of the design freeze to have an overall and comprehensive documentation of the design. So have the right mindset. So all of the team play, team members should um, have that's like fun to do the day of Mia. Um, they should um, not be pessimistic and also not optimistic. I think we will have there something tomorrow when we talk about failure modes, how to um, how to get the effects of a failure mode and how to get the severity. And yep the right choice of the software to manage data. I see there is the question of a favorable software. Um, so there are many on the market and I think it's depending always on, on the company you're working on and um, the costs for, for software. I think m many of the companies uh, use easy, the easiest way with Excel, but there you should be aware that you could have a problem with um, saving big um, data and um, it could be sometimes a little bit confusing. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, MTU, I see uh, Rob just answered, but uh, for example, MTU is using uh, IQS software for FMA, DFMA, also in connection with PFMA. And yeah, if you all um, 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 use this recommended requirements, uh, I think it's a good approach for a design of MIA and the documentation. So next slide. Um, so today was only a short introduction in the requirements and the method, how it looks like. Um, everything which we shown today and what we will to show tomorrow, you can find for sure in the reference manuals 13004 and the AS 13100, and this is available on the ASQ website. 
Um, there are several trainings, FMEA trainings available. Um, and yeah, when you have questions, um, you can also to ask these questions on the ASQ website to the subject matter interest group. There are the contact informations. So on the next slide, there we just um, made some pictures where you can find us or where you can just find further supporting materials. All of you just found the event uh, link, so I think you are aware of um, the website and there you can also submit questions and all of the informations we provide today will also be uploaded there. And now next slide. So um, this was the, the first session of a two days webinar. We, we gave you a short introduction um, about the requirements of the design of MEA of the um, AS30100. Um, we explained why uh, you should um, use this um, requirement and how you can get a successful um, DFMEA. And um, Rob um, described the method itself, how, how is the um, design FMEA done in alignment to RM13004. And I just showed you where you can get further help and guidance. So, and tomorrow we will start at the same time, um, same, same spot um, about the, the method itself. We go more into detail about how to define the functions and the requirements, how to define the scope at the beginning, and then how to go on with the method and uh, um, at the end also the improvement actions. So um, yeah, next slide. If there are further questions for today, so just please ask them. And um, I can just say thank you for attending for today and please join again tomorrow.